Today, we're going to go over an introduction to mechanical design. Design is the process of originating, developing, and planning for a product, structure, system, or component. It's a problem-solving endeavor where we must satisfy a variety of design constraints. In our modern world, mechanical design is mechanical designs are complex, and they can require multiple teams of engineers in order to achieve our design objectives and requirements. For example, when you think of uh, the need to get to space and our, our desire to, to, to travel to space, there are millions of components that need to be designed and engineered, integrated in order to have a successful launch, a successful mission uh, to space. And so you as an engineer will work in teams in order to achieve those goals. Team make, the teamwork makes the dream work, and so to speak. Aspects of a great engineer, great engineers value the opinions of others. They appreciate those of different backgrounds or experiences and know that those uh, differences uh, bring something unique to the table. A good engineer has both confidence in their calculations, but also humility um, and their ability to take criticism of their work. And as a good engineer, the quest is always for the correct answer, not to be the one who is correct, right? Now, uh, when we talk about complex systems, uh, we can think of uh, many, just about any mechanical design has, has some complexities to it. Um, there's an entire system level, and then there are subsystems. In that subsystem, there can be various components, and those components may have parts uh, as well as um, uh, um, uh, threads, gears, uh, bolts, things that connect those parts and components all together. Uh, an example that I am very familiar with are industrial gas turbines. These are uh, basically jet engines that are the size of two school buses that are strapped to the ground and instead of generating thrust, they generate electricity. They spin up a generator that, that creates power. Much of the day-to-day the -day power that we use comes from these gas turbines. And uh, if we look at the turbine unit itself, of course, there's a generator, there's a preheater, there's fuel feeders, there's a whole plant around this device. So we can call this one mechanical system in the entire power plant. Inside that uh, mechanical system, there are various subsystems. There's the compressor end on the front. This is where air is compressed through a series of, of multiple blades. Fuel is also, there's a fuel feeding system where we feed in either natural gas or coal that's been gasified. And then we've got the combustion region where we have annular com uh, combustors that take that compressed uh, air with fuel mixture and ignite it uh, in a, uh, in a uh, in which we can call this a, a component. Usually there's about 16 of these combustors uh, in a ring in that, in that zone. Once that combustion process is taken place, we have really, really hot gases that expand out of the hot end of this turbine. And there are a series of blades, both stationary and rotating blades, that uh, take that pressure and spin up the rotor. And then, of course, on the, the end, we have an exhaust system that may have a, a flow guide that controls the pressure at the end, of the, at the outlet. And then there is the rotor and bearing, this rotor that spans the entire uh, a turbine that is spinning, causing both compression of the air as well as uh, gathering a, 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 and spinning of the turbine through the combustion process, right? And then we can, you know, have a better better look on the, this is the compressor side and the turbine side, and we can see that different materials are necessary for, uh, for compression, low temperature materials, lightweight, titanium alloys. Well, on the combustion side, where you have these hot gases, you've got nickel-based super alloys, and you've got, um, you've got these coating, environment resistance, thermal barrier coatings to prevent the blades from melting in hot flames, right? So overall, as a, as a mechanical engineer, 
you can see that this is a very complex system and it's also something that a single person could not design. And so teams of engineers focus on compressor side, there's a hot end side, there's a combustion side, there's a fuel side. There are teams of engineers working on each aspect of the system and then coming and meeting together and integrating it into a entire uh, mechanical system, right? Now, uh, another example in engineering design is that design is an iterative process. It is not a process of I made a design and that's it. Design is an iterative process where once we've created an initial design and it had a certain set of design requirements, say it needs a one megapixel camera and it needs to be a certain size, that we iterate upon that design. We innovate, we add new features, we remove old features, we improve and refine what is the need in our design at the current moment. And that's how we get generations of mechanical designs and, component, and, and, and systems, right? So that continuous refinement, the need to improve the performance of our, of our components. But something that, that has recently come online that has actually kind of transformed design is the advent of additive manufacturing. Our ability to actually rapidly 3D print and free form create components whether it's with polymer-based technology like FDM printing, or even the, the, the approaches that allow us to 3D print metal, like laser powder bed fusion or directed energy deposition. These technologies enable a design build test philosophy where we can rapidly create a design, we can build it, clean it up, and then we can test to see if our design meets our design requirements. A great example is NASA's new 3D printed rocket engines, where NASA is developing a variety of, of brand new combustion technologies, rocket engine technologies, and rapidly implementing them using both laser powder bed and directed energy deposition. What's even cooler about it with additive manufacturing is that also opens up a landscape for even creating new alloys. So NASA has actually uh, created two new alloys using 3D printing. One of them is GRCOP42, which is a copper alloy, which gives us the heat transfer we need to, to prevent the engine from melting. And then another alloy that they've invented is GRX810, which is a nickel cobalt chrome super alloy that has incredible strength at high temperature via oxides that are dispersed inside of it. Now, in design, there are many variables that we have to consider. One of the most common is simply the strength of a component. If we apply loads to it, if we load it up, will it fail? Or is it strong enough to survive? But there are other variables that are also important. Things such as manufacturability. Is it easy to machine and manufacture? Uh, will our component deflect or bend too much? Is it stiff enough? Um, is it resistance to corrosion? Is it, is it lightweight enough? Does it have enough life? Can it, can, is it, does it a lifelong product or is it a product that can last one year and then you need to buy a new one? So these design considerations or, or design constraints are things that we have to think about in the useful life of actual components. Now, how do we actually do design? How do we actually perform design uh, in the day to day? In the modern age, uh, or in the, in the ancient times, everything was analytical. We would design by via handbooks and design charts um, and analytical calculations. Um, the design of components was done by a human on a drafting board with a stencil and a pencil or a pen, right? But in our modern age, we have what are called computer-aided engineering tools softwares that aid us as engineers, help us in order to do design work. One of them is computer-aided design, CAD. It's a software that enables us to create three-dimensional representations of our designs. So we can actually three-dimensionally craft uh, the design that we envision in our mind. And then using this software, 
we can then generate engineering drawings so that these components that we make can actually be machined by a machinist. With additive manufacturing, we can take those 3D models directly, slice them using a slicer, and 3D print those complex components, part of that design build test philosophy. Now, beyond the design itself or, or the, the geometry itself, we also need to know can this geometry actually survive the environment that it's subjected to? And so there are a couple of different software tools we use where we take that CAD geometry and we subject it to the simulated environment it might, it might be in the real world. And then we make determinations, we, we get numbers that tell us will it survive or will it fail? One of the softwares is, is finite element analysis. It's a tool built in the framework of continuum mechanics, which allows us to simulate loads and displacements and heat and vibration and electromagnetism as it is applied to our structure. And then through equilibrium, determine what are the stresses transmitted through our structure, the strains, what are the critical frequencies of our bodies? What is the temperature at this location or that location? And what is the resistance or the, uh, the magnetism or, or, or the current that we see passing through our parts at certain locations, right? Another tool that we use, often used by our aerospace engineers or even automotive engineers, is what's called computational fluid dynamics. And these tools are all about the interaction of our structure to fluids <laughs> that pass over or inside of those structures. Uh, and uh, these tools allow us to determine the lift of a body. So if a body is, 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 has a lifting uh, structure, uh, but also to determine how fluid flows through an inter internal structure. Are there restrictions? How does pressure build up? Do we have laminar flow or turbulent flow around a structure, right? Now, the reality is, that most of our modern design are subject to more than one type of physics. There can be loads, temperatures, electromagnetism, and fluids all flowing at the same time. And so for complex problem, often a mixture of these tools is necessary. And when we are mixing different tools together, we call it multi-physics, multi-physics-based simulations. Now, beyond these, uh, kind of more visual tools, there are also mathematical solvers that we can use. While analytical equations are not the, you know, the, 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 um, the tool that's first used, mathematical solvers and analytical equations can help us to rapidly iterate designs, particularly designs that we've made in the past. And so solver software such as MATLAB, Mathematica, MathCAD, TK solver, or even directly using things like Python can allow us to have like a design framework where if we change a dimension, it can automatically recalculate and, and give us a size of a component through a series of calculations that we've, that we've defined. Now, finally, there's one more tool, probably the newest tool, the tool that you're most excited to use. And those tools are what we call machine learning based. Uh, specifically, uh, well, and secondarily, large language models. These are programming languages or prompt-based tools that can assist us in solving a variety of mathematical problems. Um, when we as a user craft, carefully craft the right prompt, or we write code uh, uh, and provide the right input training data, we're able to, these, these algorithms are able to help return approximate answers uh, to engineering problems that we pose to these tools. Now, the ultimate challenge in these, in these type of tools is the ethics of using them. As an engineer, it is our responsibility to have the fundamental engineering knowledge to know how to properly set up these tools. We have to have enough knowledge to understand what should the solution look like? What are the equations that should be used? and to determine that if the tool has given a solution, if that solution is correct. Ultimately, these tools cannot replace our human critical thinking skills, our ability to think through a problem. 
And so our fundamental skills, our theoretical knowledge, and our ethics should guide us through how to use these tools in a successful way. It's important to note that as engineers, when we make designs, particularly if we get our professional engineered license, if there is a defect, if there is a mistake in our designs, and there is loss of life, we are criminally liable for anything that happens to others. And so it's not only ethical for us to use these tools responsibly, but it's important for our own livelihood that we understand the fundamentals of engineering.